All right, uh, let's get started. So, this thing on. You guys hear me all right? Yeah, in the back? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so we're going to sort of learn SQL today, at least parts of it, <laughs> the, the easy parts. Um, so you may be wondering why I'm wearing two microphones. <laughs> uh, so one of them is for the video and the other is for the PA here. So hopefully I can find some kind of like a splitter so I only need to wear one next time, but I got two for now. Anyway, so the first homework assignment was posted. Um, that's due in a week from this Monday. And there's also was a reading assignment, which is sort of another homework assignment, which you should do beforehand, which is not going to be graded. It's sort of like an, it's an online um, tutorial on SQL, basically. That's kind of a long one. Uh, so if you do that first, the DataCam Intro to SQL for Data Science, that will uh, be good prep for the graded homework. Okay. Uh, another announcement, office hours are actually going to be in the Wilkinson Lab, which is in tech on the third floor, not in MUD, like I think I said originally. So just bear that in mind. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, last lecture. Yeah, let me make sure it's still working. Last lecture, I like introduced data modeling with tables at a very high level. Make sure it's still working. Yeah. Uh, so we showed basically that complex data models are different than what you may have seen in the past in like Excel or MATLAB, where you just saw streams of numbers. Uh, the stuff we're dealing with in this class involves data models or, da or schemas that w define like the structure of data in, a w in, in ways in which you have multiple tables. Each table has uh, different numbers of rows and columns that represent different aspects of the data. So you and they can be linked together uh, using foreign keys, which we'll see later. Um, yeah. So co the um, you basically organize your data in such a way that you have rows, and every row kind of combines a set of elements that have to appear together. Like all the columns have to be def defined in a given row. Uh, and these are called relational or SQL databases, and they can represent much more complex data than a simple spreadsheet can, and allows you to eliminate data redundancy by having like uh, cross references. Right, so you, s you store all the information about, for example, a building in one table, and then you can have many people that are associated with that building and you don't have to repeat for the, each one of them all the building information. Um, yeah, and also allows you to add data separately for all the different tables uh, as necessary. All right, so we, we showed data model diagrams like this. Uh, we didn't go into a lot of detail, but here we have like four tables and each one of those tables has a different number of columns and the column names are described here. Uh, the sort of pink uh, columns here are the ones that are uh, numeric identifiers. So it's not really real data, but just sort of references that can be used to link the different uh, tables. You know, actually, I think I'm going to use the... I can't decide which one I like better. Uh, this sort of blinds me when I look at it, which is why I like... Let's we'll go with this. Yeah. All right, so... In this class, I asked you to bring your laptops because I'm gonna, we're, it's sort of going to be an inter interactive tutorial you can follow along with using the DV browser for SQLite program. And um, that is, you know, actually, I'm going to go back to normal colors for this. It is a program that looks like so. You can actually download it uh, during the lecture. And basically, it the text is a little bit small, I guess, but y you can open one of these .sqlite uh, files, and after you do that, you'll basically have access to a database that's been predefined and saved by someone else, in this case. Uh, so th there are six tables in this database. They're listed here, and um, each one of the tables has data that you can browse through. You can switch through the different tables and see what data is in there. Now. This view here, this like browser view here, is not is like unusual for a database really, because normally a database has tons of data, like 
uh, way more than you can just scroll through on the screen. So presenting all the data on the screen is, is like it's something you usually see for like a spreadsheet, not for a database. Uh, normally, if you want to browse through the data in a, in a database, you do queries. But this browse data tab in the DB browser for SQLite is like a sort of a convenience feature that lets you um, just see stuff on the screen. This edit pragmas thing is like just for some settings that are not too important. Then the main thing that we'll be using here is a an editor screen that lets you run SQL commands like so. Select star from recipes and get some results down here. Okay. We'll come back to that later. But that's the program that the first couple of assignments will be based on. Right. Um, yeah, so SQL or structured, qu structured query language is um, the standard query or sorry, programming language for relational databases. And um, it's a pretty, it's a good language. It's been around for a while and it's been uh, the standard for a while. People seem to like it. Uh, so most database management systems use SQL, but each has its own little variation depending on what like special features the database might have. Um, so in this class, we're going to be using the dialect of SQL that's used by SQLite uh, in the DB browser program, and then also the dialect used in MySQL when we uh, connect with MySQL later on. Uh, but there really are there are no major differences between those, I guess. Um, SQL is what's known as a declarative language, uh, declarative programming language, which is different than most programming languages you've used. So most languages are what's called imperative, which is kind of like the opposite, which means that you define a bunch of steps that you want the program to take, like you know add this number to that number uh, ret and return it. That's an imperative uh, program. Whereas declarative languages like SQL describe the results you want to see somehow. So somehow you, you write code that says what you want, like what you want the results to look like. And the, the, the system that accepts that language has to somehow figure out what steps are necessary to get you that result. Right? Um, so the database management system cleverly determines an execution plan behind the scenes so you don't see that as a programmer, although you could ask for information about it if you want to uh, get information about performance. But um, yeah, the database management system translates your SQL query into a bunch of like lookups into different tables to get different pieces of data and to connect them together and filter them out and return what you want. Okay. Um, Right, so we're going to be running, doing like interactive programming with SQL, meaning that we, we're just going to be like running one or two queries at a time using um, either this DB browser client or the MySQL SQL client. And that lets us kind of like run a query, look at the results, and maybe change the query, run it again, see how the results changed. And so we'll kind of like start off. So the, the mode of programming we're going to be using in this class for the most part is like trying something, like writing some code that maybe kind of sort of works or gets something close to what we want, running it, see what the results are, and then refine it until eventually we get exactly what we want. Okay. Yeah. All right, so here's a, an example of some s very simple SQL code. This is a select statement. Um, and I in um, most of the code I write, I'm going to use uppercase letters for like the special SQL keywords, like select, from, and where are special like SQL commands. And then the stuff that's, that's not uppercase refers to like table columns and table names, basically like elements of the data. Okay. So this says select first name, comma, last name from customers where city equals Paris. So I haven't shown you the database this corresponds to yet. Actually, it's, just a, it's a made up database, but you can imagine it's a database of customer information. And it's getting, so select is a command that, that gets data or uh, like prints data, basically. It's printing two, two columns, first name and last name. So the select is followed by the, the names of the columns you want to print. And then after that, you're specifying the source of the data. It's from customers is the name of a table. and Finally, there's this thing where, 
which filters the data according to, in this case, this predicate says city equals Paris. So it's going to get all the rows from the customer's table. It's going to filter them according to the city having to equal Paris. And then it'll return just the columns, first name and last name. And this is the result I get, right? Simple enough. In addition to just uh, th like that simple, fil we, we had a simple filter here where we just made sure that the city equaled a certain value. We can also have more complex filters. Like in this case, we're doing the exact same query, except instead of checking the city equals Paris, we have city equals Chicago and state equals Illinois or state equals Il the abbreviation for Illinois IL. And this is kind of like within parentheses. So this whole second part here is the and uh, that has to be true. Uh, for, for So it has to be either Chicago and, and Illinois written out for the state or Chicago and the state abbreviated as Illinois. Right, makes sense. All right. So we also can, instead of specifying what columns we want to print, we can use a star. Like down here, it selects star from tracks. So tracks, in this case, refers to a music database. And the music the tracks are different songs. Get all the, the tracks. And I've added this thing order by unit price. Unit price is the name of a column. So ordering the results according to some column's value. And that ordering is descending. That's what this DSC means. And it's limited to just 10 results. So th these are the sort of top 10 tracks that are most expensive. Kind of, right? So we're getting all the tracks. We're sorting them by the price. And uh, we're just uh, taking the, the top 10. So in addition to filtering, we can do some arithmetic. Like actually, if you want to do 1 plus 1 in SQL, the way you do it is you select 1 plus 1. So it's like, so remember, select prints something. And then what it prints is, is right, right after that. And then usually we have like a from statement saying like where does data come from and like what are we, and then we, have, we might have a filter or like an ordering statement. But in this case, we don't need any of that because all we're doing is like printing some very simple math function, right? You can select the absolute value of the cosine of pi is a, a valid SQL command. Or more, a, more relevantly, I guess, this third one, we're selecting the name and then some formula. We're applying a formula to different columns. Like in this case, again, we're looking at, mu at a music database, and we're taking the unit price of the song and dividing it, which is the, so the price per song, dividing, dividing by the length of the song in milliseconds, divided by 1,000 to convert from milliseconds to seconds, and dividing by 6, 60 to convert from seconds to minutes. And so it's the price divided by the number of minutes. And we're, we, we're uh, aliasing that as price per minute. So the output will say price per minute. And it'll list out the prices per minute for all these tracks in this track database. Okay? And the, reason, the way we were able to construct these, the way that we knew what to say here was that we looked at the database like we looked at the diagram, for example, this one is, uh, uh, which one is this? It's, it's neither of these, actually. Sorry, it's not, it's not one of the printed ones, uh, this example. But anyway, uh, I if we had the diagram for this database, or we had uh, a listing uh, in some other w format of like what all the tables were and what columns were available, we would kind of see what, what we could put into these formulas into these uh, um, expressions, right? Make sense? All right. So we're kind of going to learn SQL by example, but we also have a little bit of like documentation to help us to build these commands. So uh, yeah, so if you don't have these uh, sheets, you, actually, you can come down and get uh, a copy of each of three. You came in late. I don't. I don't care if you come down and interrupt me. No big deal. Um, actually, I'll put them on this. No, yeah, just come down and get them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll take twenty seconds and and, and do it all at once. Yeah.
you know, if your friend isn't in class, they can download this these uh, pages from the uh, Canvas page as well. Yeah, they're three double-sided pages. Okay, okay. So one of those pages I gave you um, has like a, like a cheat sheet. This this uh, it has a diagram. And then it has some like reminders of how some of the SQL syntax works. So SQL is simple enough that you could actually kind of sp specify a lot of it on just one page, <laughs> which is what this is. I mean, it's not. This is actually just this is this isn't every part of SQL, but it's an, an important subset. Um, and it, so this diagram that you see on this page is on the screen here. And, and the, the way to read this is that if you want to construct a valid uh, select statement in SQL, you just start, you, you, have to, you have to go through a path in this diagram. So you have to start up here, and okay, you have to go through select, so you have to have select at the beginning, and you can either take, you can take either one of these paths, right? So you could say distinct afterwards, or you could skip it. You could have some list of columns. The result column is, is a columns that you want to print, so you could say select uh, first name, and then this is a comma down here. So if you if you say first name, you could have a comma after it, and then list list another column like last name, and you could continue or keep listing columns. See how that works. So this is like a flowchart kind of for uh, building statements that are valid in SQL. The uh, rounded boxes are like literal words or, or characters that appear, and then the the kind of square rect the rectangles. Sorry, rectangles are things that are like refer to elements of the data like these are column names these are table names these are like predicates like filters uh, which so this is not a complete definition you have to like kind of know what some of these things are but this is like a reminder of how to put together a what order things have to appear in in a valid SQL uh, command at least for select there's a different diagram for like some of the other commands, but select is the most important one for printing data. Yeah. 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 Select one plus one. That's valid. Right. All we did was we had select, and then result column was where the one plus one was. Yeah. You could just. That's the very minimal one. We kind of like this bypassed everything else and went straight to the end, right? That's how that worked. OK. Um, right. An alternative way to, to specify a language is using a grammar like this. Um, whoops, I think that I for select. I forgot. There, there should be a word select at the very top. I think it somehow it got cut off. But it's select, and then you can like where you have these square brackets and things divided by these vertical lines, these pipes, you can like choose between them. And again, whenever something is inside of square brackets, it's optional. So this this uh, type of a definition of the SQL language or this type of statement in SQL also shows you what kinds of keywords you can string together to create uh, commands. Uh, but it, and this is, but this is useful mostly when you kind of already know what the language is, and you just need a reminder of like what comes before what, like how to order things, and maybe some of the details of the syntax, like where do I need a comma, where do I need to say by, or something like that. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So the. I'm not. Sh I think this might be a little too early to introduce this topic because we just barely started with SQL. But one of the other, uh, so we'll come back to it later as well, but one of the other um, like for commands you'll see in SQL is group by. And this allows you to combine multiple rows and perform, perform aggregate math functions. So uh, this should be select, what the heck? OK, so again, I don't know why it should say select at the beginning. I don't know why it doesn't, but it, it should be select and then this. Um, I'll fix that before I and then repost the slides online. Uh, but 
here we're selecting the sum of the of this quantity computed on all the um, rows. We're summing up those values, but we're not summing up across all the rows, but rather we're grouping the rows according to cases when the album ID is the same. So basically we're taking all of the lengths of tracks for all the albums and adding them together in minutes to give the total runtime of each album, I guess. Whereas we started with a list of all the tracks where each track had an album ID number for it. Okay, this is actually a pretty qu complicated query to start off with. So um, I guess the slide's a little bit too soon. All right. um, anyway, so SQLite is a database management system that is uh, kind of lightweight and easy to use. Uh, I say lightweight because you can like run it on your own machine and just download a file and load it up and run it which is different than the way most databases work that are a little more difficult to load data into and to, to like kind of transport the database from one computer to another. Like you just have, in this case, you just have one file, a .sqlite or .db file that you can hand off uh, to, to, to distribute the database and you'll be downloading those. Um, it's similar to a product uh, called Microsoft Access, but it's free uh, and it also, it, it's, like less dependent on the GUI. It actually is designed to be used on a command line as well, although you don't have to use it on a command line. And it's also designed to be used as part of the back end for uh, programs. Like for example, if you were to write like an Android app that needed to have a database on the app, you could use SQLite within the app as like a database that was in the file system that you could access to store like, you know, I don't know, your high scores for the game that you're implementing or like whatever you need to store. Um, but it, it's not different than some like big real database, like bigger uh, production databases. SQLite is not designed to handle remote access from multiple users. It's not the kind of database that multiple users can log into like over a network. It's just kind of something that you run on your machine. Right? So, so it's good for the purposes of these classes and for individual applications that need their own database. And for analyses that you might be building that you're running yourself, like if you're uh, doing a project that scrapes in data and needs to do an, an analysis, SQLite might be a good choice if it's just running on your machine. But if it's like a huge database that is difficult that you want to just load into one big machine and have multiple people be able to access it, then SQLite is not a good choice. Okay. Although it does actually scale up to large sizes if you want it to, but it's like kind of stuck on your one machine. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Let me, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's, it's reminding myself of where I was. Okay. So coming back to this first, this very first example I gave was a simple select statement. Um, select first name, last name, comma last name from customers where city equals Paris. Um, if you can follow along the diagram that there's a select and then it's um, first name, comma, last name, and further down it's from here and the table name is customers and then there's a where and the expression for the where is city equals Paris and then from there there's no grouping so it kind of bypasses that. There's no order by, there's no limit, and it's done. Okay? That's a simple select uh, statement. And so I like to present like a seven step method for building select queries. So why are we talking so much about select queries? Select are the queries that print things, that get data, uh, that essentially do analysis. Uh, so anything that reads data and just analyzes that data generally is a select command. Uh, there are other commands for like adding new data and deleting data, but for just reading data, you al always use select. And to build those, you can kind of follow a process as follows. Um, now, I s this like seven step method, it builds out the command, but it doesn't start from the beginning to end. It kind of starts in the middle and like grows out in different places. And, but uh, it, I still think that's the easiest way to go. So I start off with the from expression to figure out what the starting point is to determine 
like what table it is that we're analyzing, right? So the first decision you make is uh, what's going to be the source of the data? What table are we looking at? So you're going to do something from some table, right? And then from there, you have a series of filtering and manipulation steps where you narrow down from that full table down to the specific result that you need, right? So the from gives you the full table. And then step two, the where clause um, keeps only a subset of the rows. So you throw out some rows, you keep some rows. It's a filtering, right? Uh, based on some condition. And you know, not all these steps are required. You can skip some of these if you want. But uh, you need to know all of these for, in general, for all the different things we're going to be doing. So you can do some filtering with where. After that, step three is uh, group by, which allows you to combine certain rows, like to take that whole set of rows that you've created, that you filter down to, and like break them into subsets according to some rule. Like the example I gave before, you took all the ones that had the same album ID and you grouped them together. So you took all the mu music tracks and you grouped them into the music track, like all the different albums they corresponded to. Then after that, you can go to the very beginning of the command and figure out what's written after select. So after select, you specify which result columns you want to print. So basically, you take that table that you've n like narrowed down to and determine which columns you want to keep and which ones you want to throw out and how you want to combine the columns to create uh, new values. After that, uh, we can do another filtering step very similar to the where, but this is applied after the grouping. And finally, we can order things, either sending or descending according to like whatever column we want. And finally, uh, after that, we can limit the results to just a certain number of columns. Okay, those are the basic, those are like the tools available to us with select, uh, the most important tools available with select. And I like to consider them in this order because it's like the most logical way for solving uh, these like analysis problems. Okay. So we can summarize that into like an abbreviated uh, like recipe like this. So first, we use from to choose the tables of interest. Then we use where to throw out irrelevant rows. Group by identifies which rows we want to combine. So we might go from like 10 rows to 3 rows in that step 3. Or we might go from 1,000 a, a rows to 20 rows. Uh, select 4 determines which columns we want to return. Uh, which We can either choose columns literally or, or use math or aggregation to uh, combine values from different columns and different rows. And again, we can filter after aggregation. We can sort, and then we can uh, limit to throw out rows based on their position in the results. Like just keep the top 10 or, or, bottom, or uh, bottom 10 rows. Yep. Yeah, so, yeah, does order matter? So, what I'm showing here, the one through seven, is the order, the order I recommend when, like, iteratively, when building a query step by step, interactively. Like, you know that you want to compute, for example, the average price of um, mountain bikes sold at a store. You have it, the database for all the like the store source sales, the, all the stores sales. Um, so you you go through a process where you start off with like. Y to, fi to figure out that answer, like, yeah, there's one query that gives you that answer. And if you're really good, you can just, like, type it out in one go. But more likely, you need to, like, start, you need to s use a step-by-step -step process to, like, start off with a lot of data and eventually narrow it down to just the exact answer you need. And this one through seven indicates, like, which part parts of the query you should start um, building. But in the end, eventually, the order has to be exactly what's shown in this diagram. Like I, I told you I, on the, um, hmm, I guess I don't have the, uh, I didn't print out the one through seven, but uh, I told you to start off with the from, that's down here. That means that you have to start off with like select star from something as your basic starting point. Because you always have to have a select and you always have to be selecting something. Then after that, you can add a where, and you can add a grouping, and so on, right? You you have to add the uh, 
the elements in the places where they, they the syntax requires them to be. But you can this ordering I'm presenting here is like when I would recommend trying to build that part of the query. Okay, so so here's an example um, from the uh, retail sales database where I'm trying to figure out the average price of a bike bicycle car rack. So th there's a database with like all the sales from some store that sells bike products. Um, what's the average price of a bike car rack? Okay, so there's one query that answers that question, but let's say I'm a beginner to SQL, so I don't really know how to write that out just right off the bat. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a step-by-step -step process to figure it out, okay? So the first step is gonna be f figuring out what the from is. Um, like, what, t what, are what are the tables I should be looking at um, to get the answer? And in this case, if I want to figure out what the average price of bikes in a car rack is, so I need to like look at the, uh, so there's, a, there's a, one of the sheets I gave you is the sales orders. Um, yeah, sales orders I think has the, yeah, this one. Sales orders, it, it's one of the sideways ones. You don't see anything on here about bikes. It doesn't say bicycle anywhere on here. This is just like a generic retail store database. But it just so happens in this particular database we have, it's all about bis bicycle products, okay? But if we want to find the average price of a bicycle car rack, um, which of these tables would have that information? You have to actually look at the, t at the, at the names of columns and you might need to browse the data to figure that out. Right. So, any ideas? Products. Why products? Because it's yeah, there's a column that says retail price. So, if you actually look through all the column names and look for something that says price, there are three places you see it. Right. Order details has quoted price, products has retail price, and product vendors has wholesale price. Right. Um, the question is asking the average price of a bike car rack. Actually, there are probably two ways to answer this question. One is to consider the quoted price. So when a price is, product is actually sold, different customers may pay different amounts because maybe they have discounts or something or they like negotiate the price, right? Um, if we're asking about the final price, maybe we would use the co quoted price and order details. But, but that order details table doesn't have any information about uh, what type of product it is. It has a product number, but it doesn't have the uh, category of product. Um, or the product name, rather. So it would be difficult in that table to determine whether it was a bike rack. Actually, later on in the class, I if you join tables, you can f answer that question uh, correctly, even using the, the uh, quoted price. But to simplify this, we can look at the products table, like you said, uh, with the at the retail price, right? So we can rephrase the question as, what, what's the average retail price of a bike car rack? In that case, we can get the, the answer from the products table. So we s I start off with a query like select star from products because I've decided I'm gonna look at the products table and select star just gets all the data from that table. So by running that, uh, sorry, that produces this data here. Sorry, I know it's, it's too small to see, but it just prints out all the data in that table. Um, actually, I could show you, you can, if you zoom in, you see like all the product information, right? And then one of those columns is the price, but it has some other stuff we don't need, right? So second step is to throw out irrelevant rows. Step two, use the where clause. So I've, I take the same uh, select star from products, but I add to it a where clause. If I want to know the average price of bike car racks, I want to throw out all the products that are not bike car racks, right? It just it so happens if we look in the database under like uh, categories, there's a category for uh, bike racks, for, for, car, for bike car racks, and that's category ID five. So basically, if we only look at the products that have category ID of five, then we'll, we'll be seeing just the, the car racks. So like these two items in the product table, these are both car racks. And we know they're both car racks because they're category five, 
Um, and the reason we know that is because we looked in the category table and we saw like the name bike rack and the number five, right? Okay, but you see how this filters it down to just these two products. So now we're closer to the answer we need to the, to, you know, the answer to the question, what's the average price of, of bike car racks? Because we have, in this result, we have, the, somewhere in here is, is the answer, but we still have some extra stuff that we don't need, right? Um, the group by in step three combine, identifies rows to combine. Now in this case, we do want to combine uh, both of these to get an average. But grouping is actually grouping is necess is necessary when you're combining like from n rows to to some other number of rows that's that's greater than one but less than n. In this case, we want to combine down to one row, so we don't need a grouping. Uh, yeah, we'll see more examples of group by later. Like right now, I think you have to just take my word for it that group by is not necessary. Uh, if we, cause we can we can group all the rows together without saying group by, I guess is, is what I'm saying. If you want to group everything, you don't need a special group by command. All you need to do is use an aggregator, like in this case, average. Okay, so I've changed the the command that we are building to say select average parentheses retail price from products where category ID equals five. So the step four. Uh, it tells what values to return, allowing math and aggregation. In this case, I've used an average aggregation. Okay, and this gives 177.5. And actually, we are, and that's the answer we're looking for. So steps, we're not going to actually bother with the steps five, six, and seven. Right. So I built the query. It wasn't terribly complicated, but um, if we had no idea where to start with this. Doing a step-by-step -step approach um, allowed us to get the answer without too much pain. And for more complex queries, for more complex questions, it'll be, I think, very necessary to use a step-by-step -step iterative appro approach rather than just trying to like write it all at once and hope it's right. You know. All right. So um, we're gonna do some more examples now. Uh, as a group. So uh, I want you all to download the DB browser for SQLite program if you haven't already. And uh, download also the recipes.sqlite file from Canvas. So the program, the program's at sqlitebrowser.org. And then the data file is on Canvas. All right. So basically, that'll. Uh, right, so this is the, basically you're, you'll end up with this program, and then once you have the program downloaded, you can like open database and just look for that. Uh, that SQLite file from Canvas. All right, so in the file section of Canvas, uh, different run course. SQLite databases. In here, there's both, there's some, uh, the dot SQLite files are what I'm talking about now. So there also are images of the diagrams, like similar to what I gave you. There's also dot SQL. The dot SQL files are like, the definitions of the uh, tables. Uh, I don't. It doesn't matter. I think I downloaded the latest. Let me. Uh, I'm. This is the version I'm using. Three point eleven point two. SQLitebrowser.org. Recipes. Yeah. Questions? All right. So, all 
We got that. And the, f the first exercise here is uh, printing an alphabetically list sorted list of ingredients. And uh, let me actually bring up the list of steps. Shoot. I should have printed that it's just steps one through seven. I'll write the steps on the board. From to choose the table. Where to filter the rows. Group by to group <laughs> to combine, let's say. Combine rows. Uh, select values to return. Having is not too common to filter again. Order by to sort. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh, no, I want you. I want the SQL command, like the select whatever, yeah. and then also like the seventy-nine lines of data. Okay. Yeah, but not like the status code okay. that you were talking about. Uh. Okay. <coughs> All right, so the first the first exercise is to print an alphabetically sorted list of ingredients. Uh, and you, you have your recipes uh, diagram to refer to. You can also use, so you may not, on the right hand side here, there's a database schema. If you go to like view uh, DB, DB schema, that shows or hides that, but it's pretty helpful. So it lets you see like what columns and, and tables are available. Uh, so to answer this question, uh, printing an alphabetically sorted list of ingredients, or this to to uh, respond to this command, it's not really a question; it's it's a, uh, a request. Where wh what would you start with? So what's the f what does my step one mean? When I say from choose a table, so what I'm saying when I, when I say that I mean you should do select star from something, right? And your job is to fill in that something. That's step one. Okay. So what is that table? What are we, what are we saying there? Yeah. The ingredients. ingredients table. Uh, yes. Right. Because the question clearly is about ingredients, and uh, there is a table called ingredients. All right. So when I run that. I get 79 rows, right? And you can see that if I, my goal is to print an alphabetically sorted list of ingredients, I'm halfway there, <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm close to an answer, but it's, it's not, I have more than I need and it's not in the right order, right? But it's kind of like almost there, okay? Uh, step two, 
filter rows, what do I do for that step here? Anyone? Yeah? You didn't do anything because you want all the ingredients. You just want them in a different order. All right? So we're not going to have a where. There's no where. It's OK to skip a step. Um, step three, group by to combine rows. Are we going to combine any of these ingredients? No. We can skip that too. Uh, step four, choose which values to return. Right now, we're showing the ingredient ID, the ingredient name, the ingredient class ID, the measure amount ID. We're, we're clearly showing more than we need to because the, the request was just to print an alphabetically sorted list of ingredients. And I guess probably what they mean is a list of names of ingredients, maybe a list of ingredient numbers, but definitely not like measurement amounts, I think, things like that. So what would we do in step four? Yeah. Change the star to ingredient name. So, like, to be so just to be clear, the star right now means print every row. We don't want to print every row. We want to print specific row. We can we can specify by putting the name, ingredient name. Now we have this one. Uh, we're getting closer, right? But it's not in the right order. Uh, step five: having we can filter again if we need to. We didn't even filter the first time, so we're not going to filter the second time. Uh, does anyone know why we're filtering? We have two options for filtering. It, it's, a, it's because of the grouping. Uh, that your values can change after you group. Uh, sorry, that, that was a question that's premature. We haven't really um, seen what grouping does, really. But uh, So step five, we're not going to do anything. We don't need to filter. We want to keep every one of these rows. Step six, order by. Seems promising, right? <laughs> uh, so, so by the way, notice I, I always have a semicolon at the end. I can hit Command Return to run the command. Otherwise, you have to like click up here. But uh, Command Enter on Mac or probably Control Enter on Windows would do the same thing. Um, you can put these things on multiple lines, like, uh, and you'll have to as they get more complex. Like this is the same thing. And if I wanted to add in step six an order by. You can order by something like so. The way that I'm building, so I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of doing this automatically because I know the language and I've taught this class before. But if I didn't, if I was in your shoes, I would like look at this diagram. So I, I would like go through the steps and look at this diagram. And it says it tells me, okay, step six, I can add order by. But then this tells me like where order by fits in in the in the sequence of the command. So clearly, it comes after uh, from. So that's how I know to put it at the very end. And so what do I, what do I order by? So th this is an expression same as uh, any other, which has to be a, na a combination of like column names and arithmetic, stuff like that. Um, so I can actually put ingredient name, just like I put ingredient name in this select up here to um, order according to the value of this expression. The value of this expression for each row, it's a very simple expression. It's just the name of a column. I could say like ingredient order by ingredient name plus one. That would work kind of, except it'd be doing this funky thing of like taking a string and adding one to it, and who knows what that leads to. And it's ordering according to that value. Um, I could order by, uh, order by pi. Um, does that work? I guess SQLite doesn't have pi. Uh, let's say cosine of three. <sighs> I think that some of those functions are only available in like MySQL, not SQLite. Anyway, if I said order by four plus six, that technically works. But why does this not make sense? <laughs> Uh, yeah. W well, no. W the, the, okay, so the reason, here, here's how this, this works, like the mechanics of this. To do the ordering, so before I had this ordering, here's what I had, right? I had a list of, uh, of rows. If I want to order this, um, I need to order it based on some expression that, that is orderable. 
Like numbers have orders, strings have orders. Um, so the problem with ordering by uh, like six plus four is not that it's a number, because numbers do are, it is l reasonable to order things according to a number. The problem is that six plus four is always 10, no matter whether we're talking about beef or onion or waters or Guinness beer. You know what I mean? Like this expression doesn't vary for each row, it's a constant. Right, so it's trying to order these rows based on a constant. So th it's not actually doing any ordering because it has the same value for every one. If I put in a, uh, like you know, I could put an ingredient. If I put an ingredient ID, this is actually a number that's different for each uh, row. If you browse the data here, you can see that like beef is ingredient one. Onion is ingredient two, water is ingredient three. It's not really meaningful. Like these are just kind of random numbers that the database assigned, but they still are numbers that can be sorted. I could use the ingredient class. I could, those are numbers, those can be sorted. Um, sorry, that, this says ingredient class. So if I ordered here by ingredient class, uh, I think it's ingredient class ID, that would work. It would put it in a different order. Garlic is first because um, sorry, let me just search for garlic. Garlic has ingredient class ID 1, as you can see. Anyway, but I, I digress. I <laughs> the, 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 the thing we were trying to do to answer the real question was order by ingredient name, right? Make sense? So if every row, the, the value of ingredient name is a string, which, uh, and strings can be compared, and asparagus comes before bacon, right? That's a rule to live by, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, comments are, I think, uh, no? Maybe that? I'm not sure. Nope. Ah, like this. Two dashes, it's kind of weird. Okay, so that is the answer to this question. Yeah. What do what do? Semicolons, Semicolons uh, separate, indicate like the end of a command. Because these commands can be very long, generally they could be over many lines. S and you can also have many, there are cases when you might have like multiple commands together. F for select, it's not really, it doesn't make sense to have multiple commands because like if you selected one thing, like if you printed one thing and printed another thing, then you like the first one would be immediately kind of like obscured by the result from the second one. But if you were, for example, doing a SQL command that modified the database, like you add one row, then add another row, added another row, there are commands to do those additions. And then having each one of those with a semicolon at the end, would tell the processor that it's like, those are three different commands. So run one of them, and then run the next one and the next one, create three rows, right? Okay, sound good? So one more, see, uh, what do you guys can do this on your own? How many times is butter used as an ingredient? So take a, take a minute to try to uh, answer that, and I'm gonna get a drink of water, be right back. All right, back. <coughs> so, what's the first step? Select star from something, right? 
what's it going to be? This one's harder. It's not ingredients. Because butter is only listed once in the ingredients table. Because butter is only an ingredient once. I mean, recipes? Rec recipe ingredients? Is that what I heard? Anyone else have an idea? Want to vote on any of those ideas, <laughs> suggestions? There are only six tables. Recipe classes, a question or suggestion? OK, so we had two suggest recipe ingredients. Anyone else agree with that? Anyone disagree? <laughs> uh, OK, I think that's the right answer. Let's, let's try that. So I'm going to select star from recipe ingredients. Uh, and it gives this table of numbers that is kind of hard to interpret. But looking at the diagram kind of helps you to decode what's going on here. So, and looking at the data also helps. So we see, for example, in this table, like for recipe one, we have six rows. And for each, basically, like there's six different ingredient IDs being specified for recipe one. And they have re recipe sequence numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. And so if you kind of use a little imagination and your knowledge of what a recipe is, you can kind of guess that. This is showing like recipe sequence numbers, like the step number in the recipe. OK, step one is add the butter. Step two is add the eggs, something like that. And so you have, for this particular recipe, recipe number one, first you add ingredient one in a certain amount, then some other ingredient, then some other in different ingredient, right? So if the question we're trying to, so th and this is repeated for all the different recipes. So it's not just recipe one, but recipe two is included and so on. So there are 88 rows here, meaning that across all the recipes, there are 88 steps in total. So it's actually a really small cookbook in this database. 88 is not really a lot for like adding all the recipes together. Um, but getting back to the original question, how many times is butter used as an ingredient? How can we, well, so we'll start with this and try to answer the question. Um, the second step here is to use where to filter out rows that are not needed. So uh, the where, we can see from the diagram, comes after the from. And uh, I already started typing it, so you can guess that we do actually need it. And how, what do we need it to do? Yeah. OK. Now, why? is ingredient ID supposed to be equal to 47? That seems random. <laughs> yeah, you could either, you could do a select, like you said, select star from ingredients where ingredient name equals butter. Or you could browse through ingredients and kind of look for butter or filter butter. And you'll see the ingredient ID is 47. Now, you have to use that 47 instead of the name butter because in the recipe ingredients table, there's no column for the ingredient name, only for the ingredient ID, right? So after we run that, we get a table like this that has just three rows instead of 88. And we can deduce that these are the three times butter is used. So we kind of already have our answer down here in the fact that the this status thing tells us there are three rows. But let's say that's not good enough. That's not really, let's say we want the actual like query answer, this part, to give us the answer three. All right. So we have to keep going because we're not there yet. Uh, we have filtered out rows. Um, do we need to use group by to combine rows? Uh, this is a, a tricky case, again, where we do want to actually combine these three down to one. We want to add them together, or we want to count them. But we need to, we're need we going from like 
from the full list down to just one rather than going to some number greater than one. So we don't need grouping. We just need to apply an aggregator. So uh, on this uh, cheat sheet, there is a list of aggregation functions. It's like up here in the upper right, second bullet point. Uh, like sum, count, minimum, maximum, average. Those are all functions that you can apply to a list of numbers and get some result. Like, okay, the minimum or maximum average, obviously. But also, um, one of those is the count, which lets you count up, count up the number of instances in that set, basically, right? So uh, we can use that eventually to get this answer. Right? So we're not going to do a grouping. But in the uh, step four here, to choose what values we want to return, how can we return a number of times, or number of rows, rather, instead of just the listing of the rows? Yeah, in the back. Count, yeah. I'd so say count. And you can actually, there are a few ways to do this. You could put in, you know, recipe ID or like recipe ID. I think that would work. And you get three, but you, that's not really necessary. If you just put count star in there, it'll just count the number of rows. So this is like a little thing that you, like a trick kind of. Um, so select count star from recipe ingredients where ingredient ID equals 47 gives you three. And that's, that's the answer. So we're done. We don't have to go on to the other uh, steps. Yeah. Like yes. Yes. So let's try that. If we can't say, if we s just say butter, like this won't work because um, in the ingredient uh, recipe ingredients table, it looks like this, and all the only thing in here are numbers, right? And uh, we're, we have to work with this column of ingredient IDs, right? So that was, that was the motivation for using 47. However, we can use what's called a subquery to get that 47 in like a more user-friendly and like um, like a uh, more readable way. So instead of putting in 47, we can substitute 47 with what you said was the way you got 47, which is with a query. So if you actually say select uh, ingredient ID from ingredients where, well, I'm going to put this on a new line because it's over overrunning. Ingredient name equals butter. And I um, need to break that into two lines too and make this a little bigger. Right, so that also worked. And would the parentheses here work just like you would expect them to, like the, pro the executing engine will execute what's inside the parentheses first. It'll run this query to select the ingredient ID from the ingredients table where the ingredient name is butter. And I, I, you know, I, kinda I didn't go through these seven steps to build that, um, but if you needed to, you, know, you, could, you could do that. And uh, in another window, you know, or another tab, you could like come up with what this query was through trial and error through this multiple step process, and then kind of copy paste it in here, and you'd have your answer. And then now, the nice thing about this is that you can like type in something different, like you could say milk and run it, and I didn't have to look anything up. I got an answer of one. Uh, or something weird, I got zero, and so on, right? Makes sense. And th there also are, there's a way to do this with a join that's probably a, a better way to do it, but we'll talk about that later in, di in, in, uh, in later lectures. All right, so the next example we can go through here, how many ingredients are in the Yorkshire pudding recipe? Um, I guess, yeah. 
have at it. By the way, I, I have the answers to all these queries in the slides, so you don't have to like copy down my answer now. You'll you'll have access to it later. So try to answer this on your own. I'll give you a, a couple minutes to do that, and then we'll go through it. If you're stuck, feel free to raise your hand, and I'll uh, I'll give you some help one on one. Okay, so which uh, which table is necessary for this one? Recipe ingredients again. So that it's actually a very similar query to the last one, right? Last time we were asking how many times an ingredient was used across all recipes, and now we're asking how many ingredients are in one recipe across all ingredients, right? Okay, so so using this. Uh, Method, I'll say select star from recipe ingredients. And what's, yeah, what do we need to filter here? So you said recipe ID equals 10. I guess that's the Yorkshire pudding recipe ID. So then by doing that, we go from 88 to six rows. And this looks pretty good. And again, we have the answer we need kind of in the status uh, area here. But if we, we want to get it, get the answer in the like SQL uh, response, we need to go a little further and do kind of the same thing we did last time, which was to count, right? So that is the step four part. We can substitute count star instead of just star to count the rows, right? So another little trick here, uh, if you want to make this look a little better, you, could s you can use as to alias. So you could say num ingredients, something like that. So you'll after I did that, the response here we previously said count star as the heading, but now I gave it like an, a more readable name, so uh, it maybe is a little bit more obvious what it is. And also looking, this gives a little hint to the person reading the query as to what the meaning is, right? Okay. Any questions? All right, here's a slightly more difficult one. What percentage of ingredients are vegetarian? Where might we get, what table might we use to answer that question? Recipe classes. Um, what's in, let's look at what's in recipe classes. We do have like a vegetable uh, recipe type, but, um, the question is about 
which ingredients are what percentage of ingredients are vegetarian, not which percentage of recipes are like vegetable uh, recipes. So uh, we, I don't think we can use this table. I I didn't hear it. Ingredient classes, okay. So ingredient classes here has some interesting info. We have like meat and other stuff. So we have like meat, dairy, seafood, butter. So if we're talking about vegetarian and not vegan, then we need to like basically consider everything that's not meat and seafood, right? Make sense? So that is ingredient class two in 10. Ingredient class like not equals to two or 10, okay? So we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll need to use that in the query. But this table itself, I mean, this is definitely the starting point for, for this analysis, but this won't tell us what percentage of ingredients are vegetarian, right? To answer that part of the question, what table do we need to look at? Where is this ingredient classes? So look at the, uh, if you look in the recipes diagram, ingredient classes is connected to ingredients. That means that's where it's used, right? So if you look in the ingredients table, the ingredients table lists every ingredient and it also has an ingredient class ID. So for every ingredient, it tells you what type of ingredient it is. Like for example, is it meat? Is it seafood? Is it dairy? Or is it vegetable, right? So we can use that to figure out uh, to do a classification of vegetarian or not vegetarian, and then count them up and do a percentage, right? So, now that we're attacking a more complicated problem, it's more important to maybe fall back on the uh, seven-step method. And we can do that by starting with select star from ingredients, right? Now we have all the ingredients. And how, if we're going to filter rows in step two, how should we filter them? Yeah, so like this is how we want to filter them. Ingredient class is not two or ten. So, we, so I guess what we can do our, our strategy for solving this problem can be if we want to calculate a percentage, then we can compute the count of those that are in the class and divide it by the count of every one of all of them, and that'll give us like a, a ratio, right? So, we we can break this into the sub problem of counting the vegetarian ingredients. To do that, we can take this list of all ingredients and filter it down to just those that are not meat or seafood, right? So we can add a where, and what's that where clause that implements this? Uh, we ha I guess we haven't really, we used equal before. Uh, does this work? Okay, so here's one way to do that. I said where ingredient class ID uh, pound or bang equals like not equals with the exclamation point, exclamation point before the equals to be not equals, uh, and then I combine that with with uh, another condition that the ingredient class ID is also not equal to ten. So the to keep a row, it has to not be meat and it has to be it has to not be seafood right make sense turns out there's another way to do that so let me take that and put that in a comment you can say ingredient class ID not in and then create a set 210 this is the same okay but it's shorter and if I had like a longer list, more than just two, this would be way shorter. 
right? So let's let's keep that um, this form of it. Okay, so we have a list of, of vegetarian ingredients. If we want to comp compute a percentage, what do we do next? Um, group by combines rows. In this case, what we actually want to do is combine count all of them, right? Just like we did before. So we can probably skip straight ahead to just um, doing a count star instead of selecting star, because the last two queries did the exact same thing, right? So this is uh, telling us that there are 64 ingredients that are not vegetarian, right? We agree with that. So to that's not the question. That's not the answer to the question. The question was what percentage of ingredients are vegetarian. So to do that, you have to combine two subqueries that give you the two parts of the answer and combine them, right? So this is like the numerator, and we also need to compute the denominator. Okay. So in another t so. I guess in another tab, maybe, I could copy and paste this. And uh, like, so here's a copy of the same query. But if I want to change this so that, so that it counts all the ingredients, not just the vegetarian ones, how do I do that? Get rid of the not. Well, that would, that would compute the ones that are vegetarian, right? Fif the 15 that are not. If I want the full 88, that are either one, what do I do? Get r yeah, get rid of the entire line. I guess seven, not 88, 79, sorry. Uh, these are all the ingredients. Okay, so this is the denominator, the other one's the numerator. How do I, so I want to somehow like divide the two, right? So I'm, I'm going to take the first one the ve number of vegetarian uh, ingredients, put it in parentheses, uh, divide it by the denominator I just calculated, and that's not going to work because it's that's kind of equivalent to doing um, like two divided by three. That's not a valid SQL command. Okay, remember from the uh, diagram, every every select command has to start with select. So whereas 2 divided by 3 is not valid SQL, select 2 divided by 3 is valid. And as we all know, 2 divided by 3 is 0. No, it's not, right? <laughs> That's uh, 2.0 divided by 3 is point, uh, six 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 seven. The reason why this is giving 0 is because it's doing integer division and it's rounding it down. Okay, That's kind of a... a we'll talk about that later, I think. But um, so... To come back to this thing we were trying to do before, if I just add a select to the beginning and uh, run it, I get an answer of zero, which doesn't make sense, actually. So this this exercise was valid. Just give me one more minute. <laughs> Patience. OK. So this didn't work because of the because uh, it was trying to do an integer division, which which rounds off. But I can, I can actually multiply by a, a, frac a decimal number to convert it to floating point, to like convert it to a decimal number so it does decimal division, and then it gives me the real answer. So then here, I do the same thing and do 1.0 times the numerator divided by the denominator, and I get the answer. And actually, if I make it 100 times, then it makes it a percentage. So 81% is the answer, and I could uh, alias it to make it look a little cleaner. There we go, right? So um, that's it. Um, we basically, I gave you a seven-step process for bu building a SQL query, and we went through some examples. We'll go through some more uh, complex queries next time. Okay, thank you all.